This time on Hack 5, our buddy Mubix comes down to show us TrueCrypt, burn for OSX, and turn that PC line around into an awesome new firewall using SmoothWall. But up first, let's take a look at DDWRT with The Paul. Get to The Paul! We're going to kick this episode of Hack 5 off right, jumping straight into the content, and that content right now is DDWRT, and it's the Paul that's talking about it. Paul, what the hell did you do to my pipes? My tubes? Dude, it was only for like five minutes while I updated the firmware to DDWRT. And what did you update the firmware on? I, this nice Linksys WRT54G. Because they use open source code for their normal Linksys firmware, they had to, by law, up release that so that us little you know hacker kids Just our, us little poke around with <laughs> it and actually improve it way more than what they were willing to put the effort into. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, all what, under the what came out was these cool kids came out with DDWRT. Okay, DDWRT. And now, you said it's a firmware update for this. Yep. We don't have to do anything super special. Nope, it's just like upgrading the firmware in your normal Linksys. It works essentially the same. So, I mean, you, so like you said, you just kind of update it like normal firmware. Yep. Just you just go to that part of the mm -hmm. web GUI and yeah. hit update. And it just has a little side note, always update firmware on a network device yeah. with a physical connection. Yeah, don't go wireless. It's yeah. terrible. That's that's a, that's a negative. Okay, so since somebody has gone out of their way to write new firmware for the WRT54G, i.e. DDWRT, yep. there's going to be, the, the features that were there are going to be better, and there's going to be more. Yep. I mean, law of averages. So w what did you pick out? What I found really interesting about this is the virtual LAN uh, stuff so that way you can kind of like separate your devices whatever it be like a media center box and that kind of stuff so that mm -hmm. way it's not like kind of or your test development area yeah so whatever it is you can just completely separate in the virtual LAN under the new okay, firmware so, so the, the new firmware is actually giving you really really good network segregation yep, like, op options enterprise kind of level wow. separation. Wow, that actually speaks a lot with you. You're talking about like enterprise level. Yeah. So, I mean, so now we've got the virtual LAN, the VLAN is off the chain. What else do we have going on? For like the kind of like hacker community development kind of thing, what's cool is they have a WDS built in. Mm -hmm. That It's a wireless distribution network. Right. Which means like you can like say you're an apartment building you got like a few hacker buddies up in like the upper levels and lower levels and you can create this kind of wireless network that uses multiple uh like ap's yeah multiple ap's all one network it can be like wide open like everybody in the building can do it so everybody doesn't need to pay like the ridiculous rates for whatever mm -hmm. uh, internet they need mm -hmm. Now, I, I, I saw earlier when you we, we, we were poking around in this before, it has overclocking? Overclocking, yeah. It's it's a little... A little gimmicky, a little hokey. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you don't really want to mess with it too much simply because you, you run the risk of, like, frying the thing unless, right. like, you're blowing... You know, like, like a tank of liquid, liquid ni <laughs> nitrogen sitting yeah. right on top of it. Okay, so, but you, you can do it. Yeah, you can do it. Yeah. And since we're yeah. geeks, we do things... Because we can. Yeah. Okay, so uh, what else is going on? Like the WRT54G does have a bit of a firewall built in. How's, yeah, how's it, DD? It, all right. It has a security tab like usual. And you can like enable the firewall. You can put all, it has like a, 
additional filters for your like your ads and your cookies and mm -hmm. Java and so it's if you're running a Windows network. ActiveX. Okay, so it is slightly more developed, but it's nothing like yeah. leaps and bounds. Yeah, it, it's kind of generic, but not so generic that you can't get it on normal firmware. Right. All right, and now the next coolest thing about it was the uh, port forwarding under mm -hmm. applications and gaming where it was before. Yeah, and just like the regular firmware. Right. Now, you're like, port forwarding, that's already there. But yeah. the problem is... We only had like about ten or whatever. Yeah, I don't think it was even ten. I think we, it was like eight, like eight op, you know, like places yeah, that we could port forward, which like we add, ate up like that. Yeah, we we blew them all out. Yeah, and but this you can just like add as many as you need, and just whatever like wow holes you need to poke into your firewall. <laughs> just be like, I need this going here. I need this yeah, going there, and like yeah. it's not a problem. So, yep. So, you know, you got that kind of stuff, and it's mm -hmm. improved obviously. Now some extra features that this really improves upon I thought was the open VPN client an open VPN client yep so say like you're in your apartment building or whatever right and like your buddy across town he has like some sweet like stuff on his network over right. there and you're like normally you'd be over there but like back at your place you like you know he has something on there but he has like you know he has a VPN server up on there mm -hmm. this has a built in VPN clients Really? So then you can just VPN your network to his network Yep. through the router? Yep. So that way, when you go to his network, mm -hmm. you can just pull down just all his machines. Browse all of his shares. Yep. Just everything like be in you there. Need. Just be in, like, especially if it's like kind of a work situation, like yeah. that late night phone call, I'd be like, oh, done. We get on that network and uh, it's, it's just always there. Right. And never left just my boxers. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, now there's also one more cool thing that you were telling me about before and that's R-Flow. That R-Flow. Yes. Yeah, so this, this thing right here. It's, it's a little German but if you get past the uh, ins, it's, it has like all the same kind of acronyms so you can kind of work your way through it but Essentially, it will give you like readouts on who's using all the bandwidth. You know? Oh, so I know who to yell at when you yeah. know, like my normal browsing isn't going right. Yeah, so you know you can look at it and be like, me, <laughs> it's always <laughs> me. But <laughs> so you'll know when to yell at me because it will give you like all these graphs and crazy stuff. It's perfect and it's just built in right into the router. It will forward awesome. it to your client and you'll be like, Paul. <laughs> Damn you again! <laughs> so that is freaking awesome. Now, as far as uh, like the regular WRT fifty four G firmware versus the DDWRT, it, is it really going to be worth your while to upgrade to the DDWRT? Absolutely. Simply because the normal firmware lacks these like little special features that you need like simply the port forwarding is what we really wanted mm -hmm. it it still lacks the uh powerfulness of like a, a more advanced a more advanced kind uh, of rather solution. kind of solution but right. as far as being just like yourself and a few other friends kind of thing it's perfect right and so we're gonna leave it like this yeah so so the wrt 54g like if it was almost good enough for your network to upgrade to the DDWRT, it, it would meet all your needs perfectly. Yep. Sweet. So as far as more information goes, you know, so people can go get w, DDWRT and find a little more information on it, where are they heading? Well, they can head to our wiki. Um, it'll be in our show notes mm -hmm. for the episode. Or you can go to DDW... What? DD... Dash. Dash. WRT. WRT.com. Not okay. And or or, but dot com. All right. So thank you so much, Paul. Yep. But if you screw with my pipes again, my, dude, my tubes. only five minutes, dude. <laughs> All right. Let's go. Okay. So now it's time for trivia. We know we haven't done it in a really long time, i.e. 2X04 with all the Our live fault. shows and everything. Yeah. But we do have Allie back with us. Hi. Say hi to everybody. And you are? 
And I'm Nikki. Hi. This is my girl. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so the 2x04 trivia question was, the largest game of Tetris played on a 288-foot-tall building in the Netherlands was built by what association in 1995? Cyber, e Cyber Eagle answered correctly, and the answer was the Electrical Engineering Student Association. I want to play 288 feet worth of Tetris. I'd like to beat your butt in Tetris on a 288 foot wall. Keep dreaming. Keep <laughs> dreaming. So anyway, ladies, what's this month's trivia question? This month's trivia question, as you're all anxiously waiting to hear, is what is the full name of Section 1's resident computer hacker? Where can they send their answers to? You can send your answers to trivia at hack5.org. There you have it, folks. All right, so there it is. Either pause and answer or continue watching. I prefer the latter. <laughs> anyway, so up next is a segment on TrueCrypt from our favorite hackling that loves to come out and do things, Mubix. Mubix! Today we're joined by a very special guest that I'm sure all of you are probably familiar with by now. He's a regular in the Hack5 IRC, the forums. We are happy to have hey. Mubix back from room362.com. <laughs> Thanks, thanks for having for, me. Yeah, thanks for coming down. You're here hey, to no show problem. us some goodies. You came down from Northern Virginia with a bag of tricks. And, oh, yeah. Uh, so let's just dive in. Uh, the first thing you want to show off is TrueCrypt. TrueCrypt, yes. It's an on-the-fly encryption tool. Mm -hmm. And it's portable, so uh, you know me in portable portability. Oh, yeah. Got to have it. Um, so the cool thing about TrueCrypt and is that it's an encryption tool that you can take with you wherever you go. Uh, get on the portability. But... It works on both Windows and Linux, so, so and it's open source. And so it's open source you can't go wrong with open no, source. Never, in. it's free. Hey, I love free, yeah, and love it's free. secure. Very secure because this uses like some industry standard encryption algorithms, right? Doubled up on each other, even. Spiffy. There's Biffy. Actually, one that has three different encryption tools for the whole thing. So if uh, if you've got some, if you're somebody like us that might have some secrets. Um, you know, even if they're just like tax information and you just want to keep it secure from those evil hackers on the interwebs these days, this would be a perfect hackers. tool to, uh, to start storing your data in. And from what I understand, it's really easy to use. So do you want to just dive into uh, the Windows one with the GUI and sure. create a, a um, what is it called, a, a partition, a, sure. uh, a volume? Let's start by double-clicking TrueCrypt. Real hard, huh? All right. You come up with this menu. Now, this is where you can set drive layers and actually mount drives and everything. But so when you create a true crypt, like you're going to take a folder or a set of files and say, I want these encrypted. Right. So then it will turn those into a volume. Or like if you're uh, familiar with virtual machines, how you have like a folder, uh, I'm sorry, a file that's actually a virtual hard drive. So it's the same sort of deal. It mounts it as, um, mounts as a file, as, as, a, a drive. as a drive on your computer, right. kind of okay. like a network true. share or something. So we'll go. Create volume, and we can hit standard or hidden, and we'll talk about hidden later. So we're going to go standard volume right now, and we're just going to make a file instead of reformatting a, a device. Sure. And what you can do, you can make a USB device um, so a true if I volume. Didn't, so if I didn't want to make a um, my virtual hard drive, my, my uh, encrypted file uh, slash drive, um, on my desk, like on my computer somewhere, I could actually like take a USB key right. and, and format the entire thing so that it's now its own true crypt volume. Right. right. Again, formatting. I'm gonna lose everything that's on there already. So, understood. Yeah. Okay, so let's just go ahead and save the file then. All right. So we're gonna select file. We're gonna go to the desktop and secret stuff, and we're gonna name it .pst. You can have it any f any uh, extension you want. And so why PST? The reason I pick PST is because it looks like a Outlook PST folder. So less people trying to open it. Right, and who would have hidden their secret documents in, in their Outlook mail file? Exactly. Okay. Cool. And if someone tries to That's open it. That's a little it, obscure. Right. So it's not seriously security, security but this is security. security. Yeah, but this is the security, so it's right. just another onion layer. Okay. So, so let's go ahead and uh, save that. Right. And this is where we get to pick our encryption algorithm. Now, there's a host of different options, and you really want to find the best one to suit what you're going to be doing with so it. So, yeah, we're going to take a big performance hit on any of these. Some. And it depends on how many encryptions are going through it. So, like, 
AES Two Fish Serpent mm -hmm. will be le or slower than just AES or Blowfish. And how do you find this out? By benchmarking. So we hit benchmark. It's right button right when you're creating the volume, and hit benchmark. It's going to benchmark the data transfer between the where you store the file and into RAM. Okay. So on this computer, which is kind two of slow, fish is the fastest. Yeah, so we've got an, an average of, uh, of 46 megabytes a second of uh, right. throughput with that encryption algorithm, whereas triple DES, we've got 10, 10 megabytes. Megabits, uh, megabytes a second. So that, makes, that brings me to a question where would this really be an ideal solution for uh, if there was an application you wanted to encrypt? W would you be able to run an application or say a video file? Would you be able to actually play that video file in VLC, mPlay, or whatever yes, if it's encrypted? Would. Yes, you would. Um, I actually have multiple applications I run from a TrueCrypt drive, and we'll again we'll get that later. Um, so it is. So if you've got so a fast it's, enough it's machine, a modern right. machine, it wouldn't have any trouble with that. Correct, even from USB drives. I guess unless we're talking about HD video, it might probably choke on that. But yeah, think really by machine would choke on that anyway. Okay, so so let's go ahead. What's your favorite uh, to choose from? Mine actually, I go with the um, Triple Threat Serpent Two Fish and AES. Wow. Okay. And so it's a little use slow all three of these encryption algorithms to, to, uh, to hide your files. And exactly. Awesome. It's more secure the better. I don't care about how much performance hit I get. Okay. So we just pull this from the drop so down, and we're going to go with AES two, or Sup Serpent Two Fish AES. I'm sorry. And here's the hash algorithm. Now we can select from SHA, and that's mm -hmm. what I like going with. Yeah. Okay. So here's where we get to select the size. It picks. You have to pick a specific size. However, I don't see the option for dynamic. I think we might have the wrong version, but there is an option where you can make a dynamic drive that so you can grows expand it. as you put files on it. That's really neat. Okay, so let's just make like I don't know a eight m or yeah like ten, a ten meg. meg. Ten megs, all of ten megs on fourteen hundred megs. Yeah, <laughs> I need to clear some space. <laughs> so we're gonna get next, and here's where we put our password in. Okay. So in this case, we're probably going to need a uber secure password. Not just any secure password will do, right? twice. You can have, even display it if you want to. That's oh, not a that's very good password. Shouldn't have shown you my password. Rob, I use that for everything. Rob, I keep telling you not to use password as your password. Come on. Short passwords are easy to crack. It warns you. Oh, that's really nifty. Are you sure you want to use the short password? It's my password. So I they use actually for recommend multiple words and 20 characters or more, like passphrases. Right. Awesome. Okay. I use it for my Hack5 account, <laughs> Mubix at hack5.org. Oh well. So this is where it's creating the SHA, or not the uh, SHA, the, the encryption now, or the encryption the seed? seed for it. And what it does is uses the only way you can get truly random numbers. It uses keyboard and mouse input. So the faster you move around or the more keys you type during, which it makes yeah. the key. Okay. So we just formatted it fat, but we had the option for MTFS as well. And I guess the only time that would really make a difference is if uh, we needed to save files that are bigger than two gigabytes because then it would run into right. the fat limitation. Okay. So, so let's go ahead and see it in done. action. Let's go ahead and mount Next. this puppy and uh, put some okay. files in it. All right. So you get back to this, and you can select any drive letter you want. Mm -hmm. I go with O because it's normally not used. Select file, and it's our super secret <laughs> PST file. Nice. Comes up with the little logo. We selected it. Na never save history. Again, with the not saving your history of what you're going with. You can unclick it if you want to, but we'll okay. I don't like to. So down here with our horrible resolution, we got mount, auto mount, and dismount. We're going to mount the drive, and we're going to type in our super secret password. That and if you catch the password uh, in memory, is that going to stay for the entire Windows session? It only stays um, while you're logged in. Okay. And you can set options to like time out after certain times or stuff like that? Right. Okay. So let's now, just... We hit OK, and it's mounted. So we go to my computer, and look, we there got we go. O drive. Drive. Now, Sweet. So let's put our uh, our secret data in here. Okay. And this is where on the fly, the part of the description of what TrueCrypt is, it's actually encrypting everything between RAM and the drive. 
So as soon as I'm slapping the secret stuff in there, it's encrypted. Okay, so so if my computer goes down, it's already in, it's encrypted. Oh wow, that's really neat. And so I think what's also really nifty about the way that it, it makes this a drive or a volume is that um, it makes it really transparent to the operating system. So if I'm running a program and I want and that program stores data in a specific place that I can you know specify, uh, then and I want that data encrypted, it's a real easy way to know that it is because mm -hmm. as far as Windows is concerned, it's just another drive. Right. Okay, so we got that done. So what are um, what are hidden volumes? You talked about that a little bit when we were creating this. You were saying something earlier about plausible deniability. What does that mean? Well, it's a way for you to say someone has a gun to your head and is saying, give me your password for this true crypt or you're in court or wherever and they tell you and force you to give you your password. Mm -hmm. All they'd have to do is threaten me with a set and I'd probably give in. So. Probably. So okay, I'm going to give them my password, and now they've got all my stuff. So great, they got all my evil server documents, and and that's the end of it. Unless you use hidden folder, hidden volumes. Okay, so let's go ahead and create a hidden volume. Can okay. we create one inside of this original one that we've already put our secret stuff in? We can. All right. So we're going to dismount it real quick. Okay. We're going to create a volume. Go to hidden TrueCrypt volume instead of standard. Next. And this is where you this choose. This is where you can choose to make a new volume and a hidden volume or slap a hidden volume inside of an existing one. Okay. So let's just go ahead and create the volume inside of our, okay. our current secret one. Select the file device. And it's on the desktop under s secret stuff. Never save history. Next. Our super uber secret. So this password. would be a different password. Right. Inner and outer volumes is your standard and hidden volumes. Okay. So your outer password is the one that you can give up. Okay. So, so that's where I would put, I don't know, like tax information. So the guy's putting the gun to my head, and I'm like, no, you can't have my encryption key. I put up a little fight, and then, you know, he breaks out the set, and I give in and give him my password, which is password. Exactly. Sadly. And then he can get, you know, my, my stuff from H&R Block or whatever. Right. Okay. So we hit next. Now what this doing is it, it's mounting the drive and applying new settings to the uh, to the volume so that we can add a hidden volume. So here we go at next. Now we get to choose our encryption, which can be different from mm -hmm. the outer volume. Okay, well let's go with uh, AES. Okay, normal AES. We got it. Our hash algorithm. SHA-1. Next. Our volume size. Now it has to be quite a bit less than our standard volume. And that's just so that it can be hidden. That's where So our hidden. standard volume we made was 10 megabytes, right. and it's telling us that the maximum possible size for this hidden volume is actually uh, almost 6 megs. Right. So now my question is, if we make a 5 megabyte volume, we now have a 10 meg uh, you know, TrueCrypt volume right. with a 5 meg hidden in there. Right. If I put 8 megs of stuff in the regular encrypted mm -hmm. volume and not the hidden encrypted volume, will that then overwrite my other stuff? No, actually it makes the 10 meg encrypted volume, or the standard volume, that much smaller. So when you when you try and put more information in, it's going to say disk. Okay, um, so they, they both tug. Right. Okay. So we're going to go with... Yeah, 5 megs five should be megs. fine. We're hit next. It warns you about adding more data files than uh, in the outer. Right. Because it's making smaller. Now, right, right now, if I have too many files in the outer volume, mm -hmm. it's going to not be able to correctly do this. Okay. Well, uh, I don't think this, this file size should be an issue. In fact, I'm probably just going to use it for you know text files right. and then throw it up on an FTP somewhere because I don't care if somebody gets this file. They're not going to be able to do anything exactly. with it. Exactly. So we hit next. Now this is our hidden. Okay, so go ahead and enter in the uh, super secret password, which shouldn't be password. In fact, uh, we recommend using multiple words. Um, spaces are great, like you know a phrase of a book or something you like like that, and then toss in some numbers over 20 characters. Right. <laughs> so we hit Thanks. next. Short password warning again. Wait, yes. 
Now, here's the drop down where we can have yeah, sure. NTFS files. That's system. fine. Or FAT. Now, it's also. Yeah, it's creating your seed. Create my seed. And we hit format. Made the format, FAT16. Okay. And okay. We can exit this exit and go ahead and mount that drive. And we mount the same drive. It's asking for a password. Okay, well, this Which time, let's enter in the hidden volume password so we can put our top secret stuff in. Okay. What's that password again? That's I think so you long. put in Hot 5 Socks. Is that H A K? Yes, H A K 5 S U C S U C K S. Got it. Right. Which, of course, wouldn't be the password for anything. Incorrect password. I obviously can't spell hack. Are you spelling it with a C? Okay, we hit. We did the correct one. <laughs> That's like spelling flicker with a C. Now it shows the type hidden. Nice. So we minimize that. We go to my computer. There's the O drive. Nothing's and there's nothing there. in it. Great. So now so we, we put, put our, our top, top secret. secret stuff. Drag and drop. And we can even see already. here in the uh, details if you just click right there that um, right there that it's a 4.6. You know, uh, it's a 4.94 uh, megabyte volume. So. So let's what, let's dismount this mm -hmm. and mount our one that if we have a gun to our head, mm -hmm. our standard. Bullet. Sure. Same file. See, all on the desktop. We're gonna mount it again and put in what was that password again? Password. Password. Got it. All right. Hit OK. Normal. Great. So it, on a standard drive, it'll still say normal. So people don't know if you have a hidden volume in there or not. Exit out. And that's it? It'll stay there? O drive? Yep. That's great. And there's our secret stuff and our system volume. And and look at that. It shows it as a 9.9 .9 meg or a, or a 10 meg right. volume. Depending on how much data we put in the hidden. Right. That's great. Well, Rob, thanks so much for showing us TrueCrypt. That's really an excellent tool. And I suggest that anybody that's got secret information that they want to keep from their little brothers or sisters or even those evil Employees. hackers on the interwebs, yes those two, <laughs> then uh, definitely give TrueCrypt a try because it does look really easy and really seamless. Uh, where can people find it? TrueCrypt.com. Uh, I thought it was org. It's, it goes to org oh, okay. as well. Great. It's redirected. And where can they find more information about you, Rob? Room 362. Room 362. Rob, thanks so much for coming Ain't on no the show again. I look forward to uh, having you back again because you've always got the greatest bag of tricks. <laughs> All right, and we're back with Ellie. But it's time for the polls. So, what was the last poll we did? The last poll we did was, who's your top Hollywood Uber hacker? Now, the three choices were David Lightman from War Games, Dade Murphy from Hackers, and Martin Bishop from Sneakers, which is something I've never seen. And you're missing out. It's such a good movie. So yeah. I've heard. Mm -hmm. Sorry. It's all right. We'll, 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 we'll school you up on it so you won't mm -hmm. be so much of a noob. Yeah. Now, out of 66 votes, a disappointing number, by the way, 36 went to Dade Murphy of hackers, which 54%. is surprising. Mm -hmm. well, I can kind of see it because everybody knows hackers. I told you. It's the greatest hacker comedy ever made. Didn't I tell you? Wait, Darren has that poster. I bought it for him. <laughs> <laughs> so, this month's poll, what's your favorite audio format? MP3, AAC, WMA, AUG, or MIDI? And Nikki, where can they chime in on the poll? You can chime in at hack5.org slash polls. She knows all about the poll. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> all right. That was me. We're going to take a quick commercial break, and then we'll be right back. Dougie, 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 Dougie. What? Have you seen how easy GoDaddy.com is? Huh? Yeah, I just bought you for a buck ninety-nine. Did not. Yeah, I did. Dog nabbit. Whoops, just did your dog. Mr. Winky, my wife loves Mr. Winky. Ah, now I'm gonna do your wife. Your mother. You know I'm gonna do your mother now. Too late. I already did my mother. Pervert. Enter code HACK, that's H-A-K, when you check out for an additional 10% off any order.
Welcome back to Hack 5. Paul Tobias is joining us to show us a little Mac application for all of your optical imaging and burning needs. Uh, so what are we taking a look at now? Uh, essentially this program takes all the little burning applications from the other programs and puts it into one simple application for all your burning needs. Alright, so let's jump in and take a look. Alright. Here so we this have... this is Burn. Yep. And the Data tab. It's simply all your data files, your whatever it is. It's it's for making it, like a backup or, yeah. or stuff like that. And Pretty simple. And we've got Juliet and all the different uh, formats you would need. Yep. And then we have audio, burn your MP3 disc, or your old school audio CDs, or whatever. And then uh, <coughs> we have video, burn your VCDs, your DivX, or your new upscaling DVD player, or whatever. Or oh, just so you, if DVD. you've got a Mac super duper drive, you can burn yeah. a DVD, throw in some MPEGs, and boom. Yep. And copy. Copy. I find this one the most useful. It's for burning like your images, your bank cues, your ISOs, or whatever. All of those image files you <laughs> download legally, of course, over the interweb. Yep. And actually, let Let's me quit out of this really quick and go down to the smooth wall ISO I have and actually open it up with the burn application. And you'll find that it just goes straight to the copy, fills in the field for you, and just lets you burn right from there. Sounds good. Sounds like a really tightly integrated application. That's exactly, you know, if I were on the Mac, this is what I would be using. I use it all the time. Awesome. And, you know, it's still leaps and bounds better than any of the uh, integrated stuff that Windows XP comes for yep. with. And it's definitely better than going out and paying for something like Toast or, or Nero yeah. or Roxy, all that stuff. Uh, so where can people find out more information about this application? You can actually get this at uh, burn-osx.sourceforge.net. Awesome. And of course, you know where to find all the rest of the show notes and links from this show. That would be hack5.org slash wiki. If we sound a little bit under-enthusiastic, that's because we've done this about 10 times dealing with audio problems. But I think we finally got it. One more time just for you guys. Paul, thanks for coming on for the 10th time. Yep. And uh, let's just head back over and uh, see what's up next. Thanks a lot, Paul. Now it's time to talk about... The LAN Party! Yes, folks, it's back. LAN Party sponsored by EvoLands.com. If you want a game server, go to EvoLands. Good quality product. What's the LAN Party all about? Well, Matt from EvoLands hooked us up with a really great server, and as some of you may have noticed, the game is fear. Don't be worried, this freaky, uh, this freaky chick is not in multiplayer mode, but you can come and play with all of us on March 16th at 8 p.m., Eastern Daylight Time. I'm going to say that again. March 16th, Friday, 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. So those of you in Australia, we don't want to hear from you saying, where are you? Set your clocks. Um, <laughs> you can find all your information at www.joinfear.com. March 16th, Friday, 8 p.m. Be there. Game.hack5.org. Nikki, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for being on. Thank you. And I had a lot helping of fun. the owls out. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, we're going to take one more quick commercial break, and then we'll be back for another segment and wrap everything up. Okay, so now I've joined my co-host again for a segment on Smoothwall. Yes, Smoothwall is awesome. Uh, when it came down to us moving into the new place mm -hmm. and looking for some solutions for our, our routing problems and our, our need for a better firewall, uh, it, we looked at DDWRT and we saw that in a previous segment and it's real nice. Right. Except our network is basically, like we have a knock in this house, I mean, yeah. between the NAS and all the... Yeah, DDWRT just does not have the robust horsepower mm -hmm. to to you know shuffle packets like we needed to right i mean nothing against ddwrt or the 54g i mean it's only 200 something megahertz processor that's fine right 
but we need something beefier and that's why we turned to Smoothwall and let's just go ahead and dive right into the installation because this is an uber easy to use, uber powerful, basically enter enterprise level firewall. The same thing you would find if you bought a Cisco Pix or if you were to get like a, uh, uh, what are they, the, um, Sonic the watch guards or the Sonic Walls. This is a free alternative to that. It's uh, based on uh, the GNU Linux. It's uh, formerly known as Smoothwall GPL. And then they <laughs> renamed it to Smoothwall Express 2.0. Okay. And uh, so I've got the installation here in my virtual PC. And this is actually the installation for uh, Smoothwall Express 3.0 Alpha. But Koala. it's, it's yeah, Codename Koala. It's pretty much the same as the Smoothwall 2.0 installation process. Okay. And we'll look at this again soon. But right now, it's pretty simple. Let's just go ahead and boot through this. And you can see it's pretty easy to go through. It's menu driven. Uh, we've got the CD in the drive. Right. Go ahead and mount that. Go ahead and partition the disk. Yeah. Uh, so what's happening here is we've taken our spare machine. In our case, it was an old Dell Celeron 400 that was lying around. It's got right. two network cards in it. Mm -hmm. It's the perfect candidate to make uh, a new router out of. Right. It does need a lot of horsepower to route packets. Not a whole lot. Uh, this is perfect for those spare boxes. And uh, the great thing is, this is a dedicated solution. But keep in mind that you are going to partition and format that entire disk, so you are losing whatever you're oh, yeah, you're, on there. Oh, yeah, you're still installing Linux, which is an operating system. Mm -hmm. or, or This isn't what well, you I'm would... Not, I'm not going to yeah. go into that whole debate, but like, yeah, this isn't just flashing a firmware. We're actually installing an operating system, something yeah. that's going to be doing something on this machine. This so. is something you throw in the closet with the network cables, and you leave it on all the time. And this isn't something you're going to dual boot with Windows and game on, because, well, if you're on Windows and your router's not booted, I am... Anyway. Something doesn't work there. So as you can see right now, it's installing the files. And now all we have to do is set up a few uh, configurations. First of all, we'll choose our uh, keyboard layout, give it a name, it's our NetBIOS name. Right. And we'll configure our network uh, type. And this is where it gets a little advanced. And mm -hmm. for our purposes, what we're going to use is a green and red network. What that right. means is our red interface is our cable modem or our DSL modem. Or it's this, the WAN. Yeah, this even supports ISDN or, or even dial-up if you wow. want. Um, yeah, if you so desired. And the green network is... Local. Our lo yeah, and okay. if we wanted to, we could do orange, which would be like a DMZ, or ah. even crazier, purple and orange and red and multicolor tetrahedrons, and <laughs> we're just going to go with green and red for right now. Yeah, that's all we need. So then we'll set up our cards, and this is pretty easy to do. All we have to do is it will... Um, it will probe the computer and find all the network cards, and we assign you know that network card to this one. And we assign the other network card. If it finds one. Well, it's in a VM. We'll see. Yeah. And we'll just pretend it found one. And then the next thing to do would be to set up our address, so we can set up our address for the green network, and we can tell it. Oh, you this know, is our subnet. Yeah. The, so this would be 192.168.1.1 or 10. Whatever you want. Right. And then we would set up our, our um, red network. So this would be the WAN. And mm -hmm. for our case on a cable modem, it's just DHCP. So it's, it's choose DHCP. It would get an address from the cable modem. Pretty easy. And that's pretty much it. OK. So cancel. Done. Done. You know, we can set up the DNS, DNS and the gateway. So this would be the DNS settings provided by our ISP. Right. So we'd still technically need a network connection at this point so we can say, this is your DNS. Right. This is something that you would set up like after the fact. Right. You know, once you know your stuff. Mm -hmm. So as soon as that's all done, and of course it's going to fail out here because no right, red we interface. Don't, yeah, we're in a virtual machine, so it doesn't actually have two network connections. That's as easy it is, as it is to install. You know, it'll finish up the installation, you'll eject the CD-ROM, you'll reboot, and it'll go with the PC speaker, do 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 do, and <laughs> you're at a bash prompt. You know, you okay. set up. You set up your user, your admin user, your root user, right. and now you can actually access what you'll normally see, um, and that's the web interface. Yeah, what we're so used to seeing when working with firewalls and routers and everything else. And the trick is with the web interface, by default, it doesn't use port 80, it uses port 81, or I forget the other port, but it's like 443, but maybe a few higher, for SSL. So if you wanted okay. to use an HTTPS but right. here's the web interface, and this is where you'll do most of your administration, and this is where we can see the awesome features that this provides uh, that's so many steps above any of the Linksys default firmware, or mm -hmm. even DDWRT, or even some of the OpenWRT open stuff. WRT stuff like that. 
Because we're actually talking about a very like enterprise, high level, mm -hmm. this is gonna do what you want to do. Right, and one of the things that we want it to do right here is the web proxy. This is actually using a squid server to uh -huh. do a proxy. So what's that's gonna do is cache stuff. And here we can give it our cache amount. It's set to 5,000 megs. So it's gonna use five gigabytes. Almost. To, yeah, almost, I'm not doing the 1024 math. Right. Uh, five gigabytes of hard drive math to <laughs> store you know, information. So like if you were to download a service pack mm -hmm. and then I were to download the same service pack, I would get it off the local network. And since we run all gigabit here, you'd get it, you'd get it at a gigabit as opposed to our whatever it, our ISP gives us. Exactly, it would be super fast. And that's the same way that our ISPs even work. When you download a Windows update, you're not getting it from Redmond, you're getting it from your ISP. If you've got a big enough ISP, they run right. something just like this. In fact, probably Squid. Um, next up, we've got DHCP. This is where we can set up our DHCP server mm -hmm. so that it's actually out, uh, acting as more than just a firewall, but a router as well. Right. Now, we only have one interface on our green, and that's just the network card. Yeah. But then you just plug that into a switch, and we've yeah. plugged it into a 16-port gigabit switch, and that makes you know the DHCP work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it, it's just like a router, I mean, except for the ports aren't actually could, built into the machine. It's yeah. built, you plug into it. Exactly. I yeah. mean, you could use this for one machine, but come on, who only has one machine on their network these days? Yeah, really, like there's always multiple machines. I think we even have a poll about that. People have tons <laughs> of their viewers. Dynamic DNS. We've talked a lot about Dyn DNS in right. the past, mm -hmm. and that's, you know, you could explain it better than I could. It's well, it's just it's just a matter of associating some kind of uh, domain name to your IP address. And what makes it dynamic is the fact that since most ISPs run in a DHCP environment where you aren't guaranteed to have the same IP address every time you reset your cable modem. Unless you pay extra. <laughs> unless you pay extra to have your own IP address. Then what will happen is DynDNS will actually go ahead and redirect the domain that you have for your IP to the new one. Right, and this is where you would choose what you know hosting service you're using, dynedns.org. We'd enter in you know, our username or password, what domain we have, and this would make sure that that's updated. Right, yeah. So, so we wouldn't have to do it manually. Or yeah, you wouldn't have to go actually out to dynedns or anything. Like, uh, it'll Take send all that information to it. So like, say like noob.heck5.org had exactly. pointed to our personal network. Not anymore. <laughs> Not anymore. This, all this information, we would have given it that, and then it would automatically update Dyn DNS every time our DHCP had given us yeah. a new external IP. And that's a set and forget feature that I love. Um, yeah. Intrusion detection system, it's got Snort. This is something that is a little bit more advanced than what I can get into in this segment, but mm -hmm. we will be talking about Smoothwall in a future segment where we get a little bit more and in like depth. A part two. Right. So we're going to get back to that. Remote access, this is where you can set up SSH. And we've talked about SSH in the past, especially when it comes to setting up a, um, like we talked about using SSH tunnels to secure VNC traffic. Right. And this will allow you to SSH into your home network from the outside, and that way you're practically on your LAN and you're secure. Yeah, you're behind all of, all of your intrusion detection and all of your like security whatever. It's like a VPN connection almost, exactly. it's great. So it's got SSH built in on Windows Putty or whatever you want to use. I heart Putty. Oh, gosh. Putty. <laughs> Greatest sysadmin tool ever. And it's a single executable. Yes. Yeah, Love deep. Putty. Um, when it comes to the networking side, and this is kind of the stuff that you would normally see on your Linksys or Netgear or whatever mm -hmm. routers, it's got the basic port forwarding. Uh, but it takes it a step further. And what I really love about the port forwarding here is that you can port forward source port and destination port. And what I mean by that is with our previous router, what we would have to do if Wes had a VNC server, right? I've got a VNC server, Paul's got a VNC server. It'd be 5400, 5401. Uh, 59. Or, excuse yeah. me. 5900, 5901, 5902. So we have to go into the registry and change all of that stuff ourselves. And that's but, not any fun. So now what you're telling me is that on the inside, our, our servers will stay on 5900. So mine will say 59, receiving on 5900, yours is receiving on 5900, Paul's receiving on 5900. But then on the outside, then we just tell our client to connect to 00, 01, yeah. 02. So 5901 would go to Wes, 5902 would go to me. And it's like being able to reroute the EPS conduits in real time, no matter what the uh, port is. Nice. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so that, that's such a nice feature because that's actually that eats up so many of our port forwarding things anyway. Right, I know it's great. Also, 
when it comes to VPNs, this mm -hmm. has a, uh, a VPN pass-through. So what that means is you're able to, uh, say like you've got an open, uh, an open VPN server running on your LAN. Not mm -hmm. on this machine, but on another one ma machine on your LAN. This will take care of all of the forwarding, not just port forwarding, but the GRE, 47, all of the okay. stuff that's necessary to make that VPN connection work. You know, it's, it's so valuable to have this feature. Yeah. Now, many people on the forums have come up with mods uh, to install additional software on the smoothie, as it's called, yeah. like a Samba server or a VPN server. But that's not really recommended because yeah. the idea... Yeah, the idea behind that is this is your router, this is your firewall. You don't want anything else running on this machine because at that point, all you're going to do is add more ways for somebody to try and hack your box. Exactly. And I mean, especially if you're running it on like a 400 like we are, that's its job. That's what it's there to do. If you want to run a Samba server, run it somewhere else on the LAN. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. And, you know, that's why you're not trying to make sure that all the, fir all the not firmwares, but all the updates are on each, diff you know, it, it's just better to do it that yeah, way. Yeah, like this, this will stay updated to itself because this is, because we're actually running Smoothwall Express 2.0 Service, Service Pack, Pack 1. 1. Yeah. So like Microsoft, but only in a good way, they stay on top of their stuff <laughs> and it stays secure. Now, I love let's introduce some new bugs. I love the way that you set that up. Thank you. That's great. <laughs> um, and under tools, you also have uh, IP information. So you can do some kind of maintenance stuff from the router. Oh, I'm not getting packets. Well, I wonder if the router is getting packets. You can either SSH in with PuTTY and run ping, mm -hmm. or you can do you know, your Whois lookup from here, and uh, you've got other IP tools like ping. And the neatest thing is you've even got a Java shell. So oh, if, you don't really? have, yeah, if you don't have PuTTY installed, you can use this right through the web interface, and it's probably going to choke on the Java right here, <laughs> but to, um, to get into you know, the command line, the bash prompt of your router, and you can see it just comes up with this username and password. I'll just go ahead and give it root and the password there and log you in. You logged in as root. Oh my god, I logged in as root. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, it'll be all right. It'll be fine. I'm not going to do anything but Oh, that's really cool, though. So there we go. And it's yeah. got color, you know, and I can ping. Well, yeah, it's, it's just a full shell. Fully functional shell, and, and this, it's in Java. This is a fully functional router, and we have only scratched the surface. There is so much more power and capability in the Smoothwall Express distribution. I highly recommend, if you have a spare machine lying around and you're not satisfied with your Linksys or your Netgear or something like that, or even if you're afraid of Linux, or not even afraid, but you just haven't dabbled, this is a great way to get started. That's awesome. Like, my, when I got in, started getting into my whole open source thing, mine was just like, I'm going to jump ahead first. Let's install BSD. Yeah, yeah, you really jumped into the deep end. I mean, hey. BSD is great, but man, you, you, yeah, you did it the right way, I think. Well, oh yeah, because uh, it, it's no sense. Like, I don't get me wrong, Ubuntu is really nice. Ubuntu is great, but it doesn't teach you a lot of the things that you would really find useful yeah. later in open source. If you're looking to get your feet wet, this is a great way because you'll start off like the package by default does everything that you're used to. Beautiful web interface. But then you get into little tweaks and mods, which we'll talk about in part two. Right. Next thing you know, you've got you know Samba shares, and you've got VPN servers, and you've got real-time traffic analysis that's taking care of antivirus on the network. I mean, possibilities oh, yeah. are limitless with this stuff. That is, and awesome. the community is great. So you can check it out at smoothwall.org. I highly recommend uh, getting into this. Um, I know we're probably going to get some emails from people saying, "Well, why didn't you talk about Mono Wall?" Uh, or some of the other, the yeah, BSD like based Devil ones. Links or something like that. Yeah, uh, and I think this is a good first step, and we'll probably you know, migrate to those as well. Right. But head over to smoothwall.org, grab a copy, get into the forums and community. They've got some really great people over there. All right, so. And of course, show notes. Show notes. Always, <laughs> always show notes. Hack5.org slash wiki. All right, let's move right along. Okay, so that's just about going to wrap up this episode of Hack 5, but as always, we have a few things that we need to cover before we go. A little housekeeping. Just a little bit. First and foremost, we'd like to thank everybody that was on the show this episode. Nikki, lovely and talented, thank you so much for being here and hanging out with us. Mubix, for another BA segment, you are always welcome here. Huh? Her? Her. He'll be here again, too. Her. He'll be here again with the same shirt every time. That's right. And then Aaron for coming over and pushing some buttons and filling in for Paul while he was doing stuff and I was gone. Yes. 
and she pushed all the right buttons. Ooh, yeah. Also, we'd like to announce that we will be at ShmooCon this March 23rd through the 25th, so if you're around, you'll probably see us around and you know, come by, say hey, we'll probably have some stickers. Woohoo! And maybe we'll throw a Shmoo ball at you. Yes! Sweet. All right, up next, also, we would like to remind you about the LAN party, game.hack5.org, March 16th, 8 p.m., Eastern Daylight Time, because that's where we live. And we are going to get fragged because we are huge noobs when it comes to oh, that yeah. game. It, there's just going to be nothing but pure I'm going to be running with 4 FPS. Woohoo! And then the uh, game server is part of the whole entire Hack 5 community. Which is also included with the IRC server and the forums. Yeah, if you're only watching the show, you're going, getting about half the experience. It's that. I mean, if that. Uh, the forums are a great place to go and find information. Um, if you can't find the answer to your question there, ask the question. Somebody will have the answer, or they'll point you in the right direction at the very least. And as always, the IRC... Owine is lead. Definitely. Owine, we need to give big shout out and thanks to him and everyone else involved with the new IRC network mm -hmm. um, where we've built our IRC from the ground up and now it's a community based network with leaf nodes all over the place. So if you had low pings or high pings in Australia, we got leaf nodes all over the globe and it's ever expanding and it's a great place yes. to hang thank out. Thank you for the contributors and thank you to Owine for orchestrating being the ringmaster for everything. And finally, there's always the wiki. Yes, that's where you can find the show notes and all sorts of other fun goodies, including fabulous this wallpapers and from Test Mad and various others, Moonlit trivia about the show, all sorts of fun stuff. So and the untruth. Yes, the untruth. That's a fun yeah, place. That's always awesome. So and Uber thanks to Ashley Witt for being the wiki man. Same guy that did the dun 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 dun. dun, dun. Oh, yeah, pretty yes, bad. our theme song. That man is a multi-talented person. Oh, he's got ringtones. Sorry, but yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah, half yeah. five ringtone. Uh, Ashley Witt did a uh, beautiful, you can get him an MP3 wave MIDI. The MIDI actually sounds really yeah, good actually for a MIDI. MIDI does not sound like yeah. a MIDI. And in fact, some people have even like found each other from it. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally about, like, somebody's like walking through the mall or something. They're like, hey, Hack 5. Yeah, you got the ringtone going on all of a sudden. Like the hack, the, the, the techno lust, it's there. Yes, yes, yes. So, speaking of which, with all of that said, if you are a brand new viewer or somebody that's been here since the beginning, we here cordially invite you to trust, trust your techno lust. Alright. Hey, don't leave me hanging. Boom! Paul. Ah! Dude, look at these glasses, man. You gotta... <laughs> <laughs> Alright. but not too high, you know? Hmm. I want to be like, welcome back to Hack 5, oh my god, you're still watching because I'm not! <laughs> Alright, so we're going to kick this episode of Hack 5, Five, 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 we're up in New Jersey, and we're, we're doing some hacking, and then we throw the bodies in the Hudson. I'm checking number two! This time on Hack Point 5, <laughs> this doesn't take 10 because we had audio problems. Audio! Audio problems. Okay. This is the last one. Stupid right. open source audio. I'm good. We're good. Okay. I'm going to eat my shoe. <laughs> you want to just this one over? Thank all you. Right. So we basically, I transferred all my USB. No, no, no. Dude, I was serious. <laughs> oh, yeah. Why? It was, Why? It's cool. It would be funny. Yeah. It was an outtake. I want to hold your hand. You wanna do that one more time? One more time. Yeah. I have died. There we go. There we go. Now I, I have Because we're talking about German software. And the protocol. The protocol. Uh, we've got a little Mac snack for you guys with Paul Tobias. He's gonna show us a little application that will make us very excited about being Bits. alive. Bits, I would love some. Bits. 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 No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's quite good. Meh, 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 meh.